If you want to create change, would you become an entrepreneur or would you start a revolution? As my story will reveal, entrepreneurship and revolutions are closely connected. Imagine if every entrepreneur built their business not just to support a basic need, but to support human need. Imagine if every entrepreneur built their business not to start a revolution, but to revolutionize. Imagine if technology did not control our behavior, but our behavior controlled technology. The leaders of the 21st century tend to be visionary entrepreneurs rather than political managers. Societies encounter more change based on entrepreneurship and technology than on politics. The big difference is that the goal of entrepreneurship is not to start a business or to get re-elected. The goal is to fix an era, and the same counts for revolutions. I was born with a heritage of both. That heritage started in 1962, when a young blonde Danish girl decided to leave her country and move to the US where she had been headhunted by Jacqueline Kennedy to be her personal hairdresser. She was raised by an alcoholic mother, and to make sure she would never face that problem again, she had decided to become a Muslim, which was a quite unusual decision for a teenage girl in the 1950s in Denmark. On a sunny spring afternoon in 1962, she walked down Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C., heading for the local mosque. On her way, she bought a bag of oranges. And after her prayers, she bent down to take on her shoes, but dropped the oranges. Two young men stopped and offered their help. They were Iranian students, and they were brothers. One was a future foreign minister of Iran, and the other was my father. Dropped oranges led to a wedding, but after six years, my father convinced my mother to move with him to Iran. She exchanged her independent lifestyle in the West with a golden cage in Tehran. The following 10 years, she started several businesses, which was quite unusual for a married woman in the 1970s in Iran. She defied the Shah, who insisted on getting his picture on her office wall. He punished her by closing down her business. My father and his family controlled her income to make sure she had no empowerment to leave the country. She tried several times to get me and my sister out of Iran, but she failed. It was not until 1978 we were finally able to escape, enabled by my uncle. He was the right-hand man of Ayatollah Khomeini, and he knew the revolution was close. He also knew that if they failed, it would be fatal to us. Sadly and ironically, the beginning of my freedom met the end of freedom for the Iranian people. Most dictators seize power disguised as liberators. Khomeini was no different. But my uncle, an intellectual and liberal who had fought for the Iranian people's freedom and equal rights for decades felt betrayed. But he also felt responsible for the course of the revolution, so he decided to overthrow Khomeini. Just a few days before the plans were to be executed, he got caught and he got executed. And at the same time, my father got murdered. We never found out by whom or why, but the coincidence was peculiar. I was five, he was 39, the same age as I am today. During the revolution, the Iranian people were able to use cassette tapes to spread the message of freedom and to unite the people for change. And in 1979, they were finally able to overthrow their dictator. But sadly, they got a new. 
30 years later, they tried again. On June 12, 2009, the Iranian people went to the streets in protest after a rigged election. This time, they replaced cassette tapes with digital media, and the voices of the Iranian people reached all corners of the world, thanks to social media. The global community supported the Iranians, not with weapons, but with 140 characters on Twitter. When the regime started to close down access to the internet, software developers around the world made proxies, ensuring that the communication would continue. When the authorities started to arrest Iranian people based on their location they had registered on Twitter, Twitter users around the world changed their location to Tehran to confuse the authorities. It was called the Green Revolution, and all over social media you can see users putting a green layer over their profile picture to show their support. The Iranians did not succeed, but they managed to fuel a revolutionary drive that spread as a fire into the rest of the Middle East. In June 2011, I had been working with entrepreneurship and technology for almost two decades. And I had the privilege of being invited to Cairo to be a mentor for 38 young entrepreneurs. I did not possess a revolutionary courage, but I possessed the tools of entrepreneurship and technology, which I had the honor of passing on to these amazing young entrepreneurs who were rebuilding their country with the same tools they had used only four months earlier to overrule their dictator during the 18 days in Egypt. It was a very emotional experience being so close to these young entrepreneurs. They went out in the streets to fight for freedom during the night and met us again the next morning to build their business. It reminded me how powerful entrepreneurship can be as a tool for change. Some of them was Yasmin and Zainab. They were building a website called Supermama, replacing years of prejudice with facts and information, helping young girls become women and mothers. Sarah was building a tool helping people get to the nearest hospital. And Yasmin and her team were building a website that enabled people to collect all the stories from a revolution online. I ended up hiring people for my own company in Cairo, and I continued to mentor a couple of the teams. It was the second time I left a revolution, but this time I wanted to sustain the degree of purpose and the degree of passion I had experienced in Cairo. Because when entrepreneurship is used to create such fundamental change as freedom, it becomes transcendent. I wanted to understand this transcendence by understanding human nature. And I decided to write my book, Homo Digitalis, mapping our human basic needs with our digital behavior. I interviewed scientists across several scientific areas, from social and cognitive neuroscience, sociology, psychology, and philosophy. Because one thing is clicking a retweet button or clicking like, but why? are people engaging with strangers around the world? And how can we as entrepreneurs create even more powerful movements and relationships, building humanity rather than random tools? John Cassiopo, the father of social and cognitive neuroscience, gave me that answer. He explained that there are three universal relational structures that are the same across borders, across demographics, and across cultures. The first is called intimate connectedness. That's the one we have with our spouse, a sweetheart. The other is relational connectedness, which we have with our friends and colleagues. These two structures need to be based on a physical meeting. The third and most interesting structure in this context is collective connectedness. That's the one we experience when we gather in groups, and it can be spread online and does not need to be based on a physical meeting. Collected connectedness gives us a sense of belonging during events where we feel united, whether it's people protesting in the streets of Tehran, Tahrir Square, or when there's a natural disaster in Fukushima or Hurricane Sandy in New York. 
Collective connectedness only lasts a short time when it's established during common events, but it can spread through media, and there lies a huge potential for individuals and entrepreneurs. Revolutions are powerful movements that we generally like to support. Not only because we can support it morally, but because it enables us to act. The power of doing so is that we can help people going from a structure where we can show our moral support, we can also help them create these powerful movements that gives us a sense of purpose and passion that is not matched on our daily social streams. Often, this perfect online image that people are sharing makes us feel lonely, or makes us feel other people are happier than us or live more interesting lives. We are most of all a social species, and scientists agree that loneliness can be lethal to us. And we can avoid becoming lonely if we believe someone will take care of us when we're in need. Researchers have found that people who are on the internet and on Facebook have more relationships than people who aren't. And it's not only weak ties, it's also people that will come to our homes and help us when we need them. We must remember digital media is just an empty shell. It's entirely up to us which value and whom we add to it. We as humans have a tendency to overestimate the popularity of presence and what we see, and we have a hard time imagining what's going on behind closed doors. But sharing information about our values and norms can be a powerful tool to change people's behavior. Research made in the US and California showed that you can minimize an entire neighborhood's energy consumption by making it visible what every single family is consuming. That makes social embarrassment a much greater tool for change than information and campaigns. The norms and values we're presented with on social media is often one-dimensional and presented quantitative. So our success is measured up. How many friends do we have? How many likes? How many retweets and mentions? Rather than a deeper human value, but human value can be pretty hard to measure, and it's very individual. It would probably require some of our cognitive skills. And since it took nature millions of years to develop human intelligence, we might have to wait a few more years before technology can copy that feature. In that context, technology is still stupid, and that stupidity is often passed on to us. We experience it when we use smileys to express body language a fact that might seem ridiculous to some not many years from now, or when social networks curate content based on whom we already know, leaving us in an echo chamber where we get the same information from the same sources as our friends, keeping us equally informed or uninformed. No wonder we get along so well. Sociologists, together with Facebook's data science team, have found that strangers, rather than our friends, our greatest source for new ideas and inspiration. And the more we know about the world around us, the more connected we become. It can be hard to grasp the sociological opportunities of our time, because we're still in the stone age of technology. Facebook is the biggest social experiment in the world, and they're starting to learn new things about our species, based on their largest real-time human database in history. In 1967, researchers found that there are six links between two people in the world. Facebook was able to repeat this study and found, not on a few users, but on all their users, at that time, 721 million people, that there are actually only four links between two strangers in the world. They also found that emotions tend to spread and can be manipulated online. So if we're exposed to certain emotions online, we'll start to express them. And when our friends support a cause, we're more likely to do the same, whether it's voting, donating our organs, or supporting a cure for Ebola. Michael Hart, professor of literature at Duke University, taught me 
that revolutions tend to spread across borders, as we saw it from Cairo to London and from Athens to Madrid. But every time they take a different form, inspired by their source, rather than being repeated. We have always rebelled, and we have always fought for our freedom. What changed is the media and a shift in authorities. Who do you think is most powerful today? Mark Zuckerberg, that governs 1.3 billion people and knows everything about our social patterns or behavior? Or any prime minister or president? When dictators and despots close access to the internet, it's Facebook, Google, Twitter, or another internet company that acts and ensures that communication continues. Their visions are as global as their communities that are larger than most nations. They are the oligarchs of our time, and data is their new, most valuable asset. Even though they possess a new kind of power, they might be our only hope to find sustainable solutions to the challenges we face. We, or most of us, agree that we need new models in society, but we can't seem to agree on the solutions, because the solutions are not compatible with democracy or capitalism. Even though it might feel we change so much based on technology, evolution happens very slow. But with the challenges we face, we no longer have the luxury of time. We have to act better, and we have to act faster. Knowledge, imagination, and action must merge. We need the knowledge from scientists to understand our species. We need artists to show us the borders of our imagination. And we need entrepreneurs to act. If you want to create change, your best chance might be as an entrepreneur. If you want to seek freedom, your best chance might be to start a revolution. Unlike politics and most organizations, the foundation of entrepreneurship is built on trial and error, risk and failure, until we find a model that works. The ethos of entrepreneurship is spreading to all corners of the world, and we now see new role models paving the way into a new industrialized age, with hardware and software as a mean and change as a goal. Change does not come from great deeds, dictators, or despots. It comes from the small actions of everyday heroes, iterating and acting, not to be recognized, not to be enriched, but to do what humans do best, to evolve. Our journey as Homo digitalis has just begun, and is built on the foundation of our ancient needs, our need for freedom, our need for purpose, and our need for connectedness. Where communication lives, dictatorship dies. Where there are dreams, there is hope. We are not waiting for technology. Technology is waiting for us. Waiting for us to dream a little bit more crazy, and waiting for us to do the impossible. I was lucky enough to have a mother who taught me that if you can dream it, you can do it. And whatever crazy or impossible idea I presented her with, she not only supported me, she also told me that I would do great, which was not always the truth. But you do not argue with a woman who overcame the Kennedys, defied a Shah, and survived a revolution. She is my role model. We all need role models, and we all are role models. We can all dream, and we can all do. So let's replace big words with small actions. And not only build a better future with technology, but build technology for the future of humanity.